On today's episode of The Lucid Lens, Representative Glenn Grothman says that more hearings are coming, but a select committee is not needed. I'm going to give a little political science lesson on subpoena power and dig into why I think a select committee is needed. Also, UFO Disclosure Act 2.0 is already within the Senate. Uh, eminent domain was the sticking point with the original legislation. Doesn't the U.S. government already have the right to exercise eminent domain? We're going to dig into that. Also, James Fox's new documentary has a little bit of an update. We're going to see what's going on with that, but how much can a documentary or a book actually move disclosure forward? We'll dig into it. Let's go. There's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. Intelligence representative at a high level from the U.S. government is saying publicly, we are not alone. Greetings, you beautiful people, you marvelous citizens of the planet Earth, and welcome to The Lucid Lens. I'm just some dude asking what I think are totally irrational questions about this extraordinary topic, UFOs, UAP, and other related phenomena. If you enjoy what you're hearing, consider subscribing. Leave a like, dislike. More importantly, I want to hear from you. What do you think is really going on out there? Also, I'd like to welcome all the new subscribers. We like doubled over the weekend, which is a very pleasant surprise. So welcome, and I must be doing something right. All right, let's get into our first story today, which is James Fox and the program. We've got some updates from him. He's got a rough cut finished, and he teased some testimony, which I'm assuming is a first-hand witness whistleblower who worked in, well, the program. So the question I have is, will this documentary contain incredible revelations and bring forth disclosure? Eh, probably not. I mean, much like Lou Elizondo's book, a documentary or a book isn't going to suddenly change the mind of the rest of the world. It won't be the singular event that forces disclosure, right? I mean, look at George Knapp and Dr. James Lukatsky's last book, where Lukatsky, who ran OSAP, admitted we had non-human craft and that they breached the hull. And the media ignored it, and most of the population didn't hear about it. So here we are, still waiting for disclosure. Um, I don't think any book or documentary is going to bring disclosure on its own. I mean, that's not what their purpose is. They're not meant for, uh, for us who have seen enough evidence already to rationalize that there's something going on here. It's, they're meant to intrigue those who are still on the fence. Um, it, it's you know another credible voice coming forward just... Sharing what they know will garner more attention, and each one just adds a piece to the puzzle that slowly pulls in the awareness of more and more people. And we're going to reach a critical mass at some point. Look, there's you know a couple different types of these documentaries, uh, and they all have different purposes. One is for folks like us who already know the phenomenon's real, and you know serves as further education for those already in the loop. You know, they might be a little more narrow in scope and cover a specific case or particular aspect of the phenomena, uh, but it hopefully should contain new information and you know tread some new ground. And then there's documentaries which serve as a good overall entry point into the topic. I think James Fox is the phenomena and what uh, the new series National Geographic's been running have been fantastic, and those are excellent places to start and you know walk into this. Uh, but I haven't seen the program yet. And for all I know, it could have a prominent figure stepping out of the shadows uh, to confirm what so many others have already, uh, turning you know more and more skeptics into believers or knowers, because, I mean, after a certain point, you just kind of know, right? Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, what do you guys think? Will there be a big reaction to the doc if another whistleblower comes out, or is it just kind of, you know, more fuel to the fire? Because, you know, it's really nothing new. We've all heard it before. What do you guys think? All right. Story number two. We're going to take a trip over to Askapol, where Representative Glenn Grothman says that a new hearing is coming, but a UAP select committee is not necessary. Hmm. Let's take a listen. Have you seen that letter in your committee for uh, asking for a select UAP subcommittee? Oh, we might, I think we're going to hold another hearing in the subcommittee. So that really won't be necessary. Oh, yeah. Like, what do you think of their ask for another subcommittee? Just redundant? Not needed? Oh, uh, sure. 
the fun either because we've held a bunch of not hearings but three things in the skiff and we're gonna do something yeah we're not done with it not done with it i'll be watching sir as always appreciate you okay so he says more hearings are coming which is great that's that's awesome we definitely want more hearings but then he says we don't need a select committee What's the difference? Why would we need a select committee? Okay, so look, the hearing last year was held by the House Oversight National Security, the Border and Foreign Affairs Subcommittee, which Grothman chairs. This is part of the larger House Oversight and Reform Committee, which is a standing committee in the U.S. House of Reps. Okay, so a standing committee. What is that? These are permanent committees in Congress that are established by the chamber's rules Standing committees have broad jurisdiction over specific policy areas, such as finance, judiciary, foreign affairs. These committees typically have subpoena power granted to them as part of their regular authority. The chairs of these committees can authorize subpoenas within the scope of their jurisdiction without needing approval from the full chamber. The key word is within the scope of their jurisdiction. So the question here is, what does the subcommittee have jurisdiction to issue subpoenas related to UAP and the programs and where those programs reside, I don't think it does. It has oversight of national security, but not national intelligence or defense, which is where these special access programs reside. They don't have jurisdiction over the departments where these things are hiding. So our our Congress people stupid? <laughs> Do they not realize they can't issue a subpoena outside of their jurisdiction? Or do they not think they need to necessarily issue subpoenas? So now if we had a select committee, these are temporary committees established for a specific purpose, often to investigate a particular issue or event. They can also be granted subpoena power, but this authority usually requires a vote by the full chamber to authorize a subpoena. Select committees are typically created when there's a need for a focused investigation or oversight beyond the purview of existing standing committees. So in this case, it would be a UAP only select committee. And I guess they would be granted power to any and all departments that have UAP, you know, handlings, right? So Grothman, I think you're wrong unless you plan on leveraging subpoenas because the next hearing, are, this is the thing. Maybe they don't plan on leveraging subpoena power because if the next hearing that they have really blows the roof off of things, then the Senate Intelligence or Armed Service Committee can come in and take it from there. So maybe they kind of are playing the long game here where they don't necessarily need subpoena power per se because they can still have whistleblowers and witnesses come in. I mean, we had Grush was able to come in, right? So as long as they have people that are protected under the witness uh, whistleblower protections, they can say as, as much as needed to compel the rest of Congress to be like, whoa, all right, we need to have our committee and X, Y, and Z, or I'm sorry, our hearing and X, Y, and Z committee that actually does have the jurisdiction and oversight uh, to, to dig in and, and subpoena these defense contractors, military, uh, you know, whatever, defense, uh, intelligence, what have you, right? They can actually get those people out. So maybe the House Oversight Committee is just kind of teeing it up and they're going to pass the baton over to Senate Intel and they're going to take it from there. I don't know. That could be it. Um, what do you guys think? Is a select committee even needed? I mean, if a hearing gets enough attention and some of the more powerful committees can take over and, and, you know, bring it to the end zone, do we even need a select committee? I mean, it certainly would expedite things, but maybe we're on some sort of schedule or timeline. I don't know. I keep, I keep feeling like this is, this whole process is being throttled intentionally. At least it feels like it to me. All right. With that story down. Our main story today. So Whitley Strieber had Daniel Sheehan on to discuss uh, the current state of the disclosure process in Washington and what parts of the original legislation made it through the National Defense Authorization Act this year. But more importantly, the 2.0 version of the bill is in the Senate right now. 
Let's go ahead and take a listen. And so there is now uh, prepared in, in the hands of the United States Senate Intelligence Committee a, uh, a UFO Disclosure Act 2.0 version, okay, which is substantially the same as the original bill. They've made some additional provisions of pointing out, for example, in the eminent domain portion of the bill that was to grant the power of eminent domain to that independent nine-person board of review to extract the information from the agencies and extract the information from the private aerospace industries. And very importantly, to, to lay claim to any of the technology, any of the crafts that had been turned over to any of the private aerospace corporations that under the exercise of eminent domain, the United States government would reclaim its authority to own that property. Uh, now that has been a big sticking point. It certainly has. And the aerospace industry was up in arms basically over that. Uh, and what, but, but, you know, the, they're, they're not entitled to, to maintain uh, private property any more than any other citizen would be, you know, and the fifth, the, the fifth amendment, the United States constitution has the eminent domain provision in it saying specifically that the United States government as constituted under our constitution has the authority to exercise eminent domain over particular property. As long as they, uh, as long as they're willing to pay a reasonable fair market value for whatever the property is that they seize. And it has to be seized for a, pub, a bona fide public interest. Okay. So it'd be interesting to find out how they dis determine a fair market value for that particular property. Well, the, the, it would be uh, basically the, there's a doctrine in the law called quantum merit, which is that, you know, it's worth whatever the service is that they provided. You know, if, if that aerospace industry provided a certain number of man hours or person hours devoted to trying to understand the technology, they could be paid for that at a fair market rate. You know, of what, what it would cost to have that kind of research done. Yeah. But they, they don't, they're not entitled to own property rights to the title, of, to, to intellectual property rights to the property. That's the point of the debate right now. They, they want to have intellectual property rights over the technology. And that would give them the right to continue getting a portion of the value of that technology into the future for any open-ended amount of time. If that technology was ever used by anyone uh, in the private sector. How could you have intellectual property rights over something that another species invented? Yeah, I don't know how they're going to negotiate that, but it's interesting. So so I didn't show up, but Sheena touches on what parts of the original act did in fact pass, which was really just the core piece that all these government and defense entities turning over what information they have to the National Archive, right? And the October 18th date is when everything must be submitted by. So we have a tangible timeline to look at, even with nothing else happening. However, without the nine-person independent review board panel overseeing the information, we're stuck with the Defense Department making the determination of what can be made available to the public. Although the deputy secretary, this is something I actually haven't seen anyone really talk about, and then this did pass. The deputy secretary of defense and the director of national intelligence must brief the congressional defense committees, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and congressional leadership on options to improve reciprocal access and coordination on similar issues. So what does that mean, though? Are they actually going to get read in and actually have oversight? And they're going to work and see how they could maintain oversight over this and other similar issues in the future? I don't know. That's a little ambiguous there. But um, anyway, enter the new 2.0 version of the bill. So the the sticker was the eminent domain clause where the defense track contractors had issue with. But as Sheehan pointed out, the Fifth Amendment already grants the government the right to seize property for public use, provided the property owner is fairly compensated. Keyword, fairly compensated. But so why was eminent domain targeted and removed from the original bill, if the government already has that power? Well, the bill didn't just grant the ability 
for the government to exercise eminent domain. It specifically mandated the federal government exercise eminent domain. That's an order to seize the property, and that may have lessened any negotiation powers that co- defense contractors had with any compensation they would get. So at the end of the day, it comes down to a few things. Like we all want to know the truths. So tell us as much as you can without giving away state secrets. And But number two, if you're sitting on technology that can change the world, we got to open up research to the public and you know, probably need some treaties signed to prohibit manufacturing weapons from it. But it, going back to the, 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 the question, like, what, what's fair compensation for this? It, 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 how can you own something that you didn't invent? I mean, it, that's like, I, 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 don't, I don't even have a good analogy for that, but that's what Sheehan says they're negotiating now. And look, I'm like, give them, you know, full amnesty, allow them to stay involved, you know, whatever it takes to safely get as much information out to inform the public and, and leverage any potential breakthroughs that can help us. <laughs> I mean, that's what's going to be needed for us to move forward from this, right? But how much are they going to open up? Uh, I, I don't know. We'll see what kind of teeth this uh, version 2.0 is going to actually have. Will the board make it through this time? I mean, are they going to negotiate? Fine. Figure out a way for them to to, to keep, stay, keep making money. But we, the people of this planet, need to benefit from any of these, you know, potential discoveries that have been made. I mean, I think that's really what it all comes down to. And... Why have they been hiding it all this time? I mean, that's a whole other can of worms, you know. But anyway, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think about all these stories down in the comments below, and I'll see you on the flip side.